Okay, hi, I'm ready to get things started. Um, I first just really want to give a general welcome and thanks to everybody for turning out for this uh, showcase and celebration. I'm Katie Ullman, I'm Associate Dean of the Graduate School, and this has been a um, really uh, sort of an ambitious project for us to get 3MT back from a, uh, I think a kind of a little bit of a different plan during COVID. We did it once virtually, but it was also really a harder thing to get together um, during that time. So we kind of relaunched it this year, and there are a lot of people that I did want to start by thanking, and then I'm going to turn it over to Francine, who's going to give you um, more of an idea of what this uh, training and showcase is all about. So, oh, and before I start, I did write myself a note, because I had to do this myself. It's probably good if everybody silences their phone so that we don't have unexpected interruptions. Um, so, just to, I guess there was going to be some slides too, I'm happy um, well, you know who I am now. So I do want to uh, thank a group of postdocs who um, volunteered their time to help us uh, whittle down the number of people that we would have in the final showcase, so they helped uh, score the video entries of all the participants who, who submitted them and then we took those scores to develop the um, list of people for today. I will say I watched all the videos and I was so impressed with all of them. So I'm glad somebody else had to make those decisions. But these postdocs are ones that um, have a real interest in research communication themselves, and it was really nice to have them get involved, very generous of them, and they also took some time to come to the training session, so hopefully that's a way we can expand 3MT in the future. And so Jen Parkman, Austin Green, Josh Schull, Caleb, Rabia, Nien, Lee, and Kate Ward, who really come from all over campus actually. And Josh is a 3MT alum even, so that's also kind of neat. Okay, and um, let's see. I I don't think she made a slide, but I want to make a point of thanking uh, Sabrina back there, <laughs> Sabrina Smith, who um, really is the mastermind behind uh, everything that has happened for 3MT. We did try to take a divide and conquer approach, but to do that, you actually have to have somebody who's like in mission control, making it all work, and she really did go the extra mile to keep communication between all the different groups and um, just put the whole thing together. So thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Um, okay, and then, then I want to um, introduce our judging panel for today. So today there are three guests who are going to get to make the hard decision of who the final is final winners are for this competition. And uh, they're here, uh, obviously. Natalie Gochnauer uh, is, uh, you might want to wait. <laughs> uh, she is the director, <coughs> sorry, the, um, she's at the David Eccles School of Business, but also is the director of the Kempson Gardner Policy Institute and the chief economist for the Salt Lake Chamber. Her, when she speaks later, her voice may sound familiar because she's also a host of a uh, radio show called Both Sides of the Aisle. And uh, I know, I always think, oh, that voice sounds familiar when I hear her. Um, and then we have, uh, I guess I'm Gretchen Case, I'm just looking at what order they are up there. Um, so Gretchen is somebody I know from up in the School of Medicine, which is my act. And she's got an interesting job up there as sort of a bridge between humanities and the science of medicine. And um, she is uh, director of the Center for Health Ethics, Arts, and Humanities. Uh, a fun fact about her, I tried to sort of find one for each of them, but um, she's a professor in internal medicine, but her PhD is in performance studies. I kind of like that combination. <laughs> so, welcome to Gretchen. And then uh, Marcus Babs, who feels right at home in this building, because he is in the College of Science, uh, and he's the director of the Henry Eyring Center for Cell and Genomic Science. Uh, and 
Marcus is from Switzerland, which I just think adds a little bit of international perspective. Uh, and uh, I look forward really to, to hearing more from the judges later as they give a few uh, words when they uh, present the, the winners at the end. I would say, though, that this panel of judges, I just want to emphasize that in each of their roles, I think that the communication of research is really central, whether they're talking to uh, potential donors or physicians or politicians. It's really all about being able to clearly convey the importance and the substance of research. And probably the biggest thanks here goes to the facilitators. Um, they are volunteers from across campus who uh, feel passionate about research communication and really have taken on this project on the side just because to them it's, it's an important part of training for graduate students. Um, you'll, he you'll hear a little bit from them as they introduce people, but just so you know who they are, Francine Mahak and I'll, uh, she'll come back and tell you more about 3MT. Amy Hawkins is here, and, <laughs> and uh, up from biochemistry. Andrew George is here. He um, is in the um, STEM ambassador program, something you might want to learn more about from him if you get a chance. And Jennifer Lyer Seagrave couldn't be here, but she's been a long time facilitator in 3MT and really guided us uh, through much of this process. So, I, I really want to extend um, sincere thanks to those facilitators. Okay, now I will, um, I, I guess one thing, I, I think actually all I need to do now is introduce Francine because she's going to finish the explanation of what 3 is and what we'll be doing. the exciting and important research that graduate students do, and also it helps enhance the skills that they can use to engage broader audiences. So the challenge is really to present in, in a way that's really quite different from the way they normally are trained to present to their peers, to their faculty and to scholars in the field at conferences and things like that. So it takes a lot of mental elasticity and imagination to do what they're going to do today. And broader audiences can include, for example, potential donors for their research. It can be scholars from different fields for potential collaborations who just see connections with the research that may be more obvious. Um, how about legislators? In the public, so that they can all understand the importance of their research. And industry employers who may seek to hire them, those are just a few of the broader audiences that are possible uh, with these skills. And so the challenge for them is to engage people like all of us who each have our own field of specialization and want to understand what is important and exciting and significant about the research. Um, because that's what we want to know. And so there's a lot less focus on methodology, especially since it's three minutes with one static slide, that's the rule. And there's more on what would engage the audience, like what is significant about this, where's the problem that you're trying to solve, how are you going about it, overview, what do you hope to find that might produce a solution now or down the road by contributing. So that's really quite an accomplishment. So how did 3MT spring to life? Well, it was invented in 2008 in the University of Queensland in Australia by a professor called Alan Lawson, who was at the time the dean of their graduate school. So Professor Larson was home in his shower when he became inspired. So I'll, I'll, I mean, isn't that where most of us get our best ideas anyway? 
Yes, of course. So, what makes this a little bit of a special situation is that Queensland at the time was suffering a terrible drought, and so municipalities and uh, utility companies were distributing waterproofed three-minute egg timers for people to put in their showers at home to conserve water. So there was Professor Lawson in his shower, his three-minute shower, and he made the conceptual leap from three-minute shower to three-minute thesis, thinking, this is obviously perfect as a format for our graduate students to engage broader audiences in their research. So that's how it started. And now, Three Minute Thesis is in at least 85 countries and 941 institutions. Probably more, this goes back to just before the pandemic, but it's all over. So, including the University of Utah. And our graduate school has sponsored this program, Three Minute Thesis, <coughs> training and competition since 2014. Okay. So a little bit about our prizes today. We will have a runner-up prize for $100. Sorry, an audience choice prize for $100. A runner-up prize for $200. And the uh, first um, winner, uh, which will be $300. And that person will have the chance to present their three-minute thesis at the WAGS conference in Portland this much. WAGS is Western Association of Graduate Schools, right? Okay. So, for the schedule, just a quick overview here. So, uh, we're going to be hearing in just a moment from our nine presenters, their 3MD talks, and then we'll take a 30-minute break. That will enable the judges to go deliberate, and uh, it will also enable you to do your audience choice vote. So you see a little slip of paper in addition to the program on your desk. And if you don't see one all the way back there, find one on the tables closer in. Because we, we have enough for you all. Uh, we just couldn't get enough back there. So, so you, you can track the presenters. And uh, when it's time for you to leave, I'm going to go outside for refreshments. Before you go out, just to mark uh, Tick the box next to the one presenter you would like to nominate for the Audience Choice Award and drop it in the basket outside to the right on the 3MT table with a black uh, tablecloth. There's a basket there to put it in. That way we can gather them all and take them to the judges. And, oh, and during the break while you're out enjoying refreshments, please make sure to not bring any refreshments back in. We can't have food or drink in this room. All right, and so now, time to hand this to Andrew. Andrew George will be announcing the first. I am originally from Brazil. I grew up speaking Portuguese, but when I was 19, I moved to England. 
and I had to speak English every day with people from many different nationalities. Soon, I realized that speaking a perfect English grammar was not enough to avoid misunderstandings. One day, I had an issue with my roommate who didn't understand why I wore sandals at home in the middle of winter. I said sandals, but maybe you thought about flip-flops or thumbs. Understanding culture and where people come from is a crucial aspect of communication nowadays. So why should we all develop intercultural skills? Well, we do want World War III to happen because of a misunderstanding. Because we live in this multicultural society, bilingual schools across the United States have focused on preparing students to live, work, and interact with each other by teaching them how to read, speak, listen, and write in a foreign language. Although culture is one of the main goals of immersion education, the culture goal has received less attention than the proficiency goal. My research helps to fill in this gap by assessing students' intercultural competence in elementary and middle school. Surprisingly, I found out that for younger children, as their ability to speak the language increases, their intercultural openness also increases. But for older children, the tendency is the opposite. As their ability to speak the language increases, their intercultural openness decreases. It is like when you leave school with no knowledge of how taxes work, but proficient at reciting the order of the U.S. presidents and taking care of an egg baby. There are some possible explanations for this shift in intercultural competence. Well, maybe young children are naturally more open towards other cultures and are less concerned about defining who they are. Or, the structure of the program itself can influence the students' intercultural competence. In elementary school, kids are exposed to the target language and culture for a longer time than middle schoolers are. So, the findings of my research will help the Education Board review the current curricula and make the necessary changes to make sure students are prepared to live in a globalized society and prevent worse from happening. So next time you think about languages, think also about cultures. Thank you. they are demographically, and what services and tasks they report providing. 
But today, we don't know what value they hold for patients with families, if any. And that's where my work comes in. I'm asking broadly, how you and values do end-of-life doulas hold for end-of-life care? And I'm attempting to answer this through two primary means. First, I'll be talking with families about their experience of doula support during the death of a loved one. It's only through these conversations that we can learn about that experience and whether and how that support impacted them. Additionally, I'm surveying end-of-life doulas about their values and motivations. Preliminary findings indicate that they are motivated to work with, but not necessarily in, the healthcare institution to change the way we die by increasing well-being at end of life. Through this work, we can gain important insights into healthcare practice limitations at end of life and potential bridges for providing that support. This work isn't expected to promote the generalization of new qualities, but rather to validate the contributions of various care supports to producing positive outcomes. End of life is complicated and it's hard. My work can help us understand what patients and families need in one at end of life and how we can provide that support using all the pieces of the puzzle. Thank you. actually a good thing. For instance, bacteria in the soil help our plants to grow, and bacteria in our guts are absolutely essential to good health. Bacteria in all of these places prefers to, prefers to reside together in communities. By doing so, it's better able to conserve resources like nutrients and water, and it's also able to put up a pretty good defense against harms like antibiotics. Similar to a cancer tumor, biofilm is capable of spreading or expanding all with ease. So, when a car rolls across the pavement, when a bomb goes off on the front lines, when a bullet is fired, bacteria from our environment, from dust, dirt, debris, even our clothes, is released and freed to lodge deep within wound sites. Our tissues, especially our inner tissues, provide the ultimate buffet for bacteria to eat and divide. Early administration of antibiotics is critical to the prevention of long-term infection. I work in the Bone and Biofilm Research Lab, and I collaborate with another company to develop a heavy-duty antimicrobial gel. So as Neosporin is a minor cut or scrape, this gel is to exposed fractures, severed tissues, major burns, and it was designed to be very easy to use, especially on the front lines. It works by combining two syringes, one that has a, a dose of antibiotics capable of eradicating biofilm, and another syringe that has a formulation that holds the antibiotics in until it's time for them to release into the wound. It's lightweight and it's fairly easy to use. It can be slathered into anything and it remains in place. In our studies, we've seen it actually prefers to stick to blooded tissue instead of a gloved hand. It will resist irrigation, and it releases antibiotics at concentrations high enough to kill biofilm for up to one week. This is plenty of time for the injured person to make it to a hospital for major orthopedic treatment. Once they're in the operating room, the surgeon's capable of removing this through regular cleaning procedures. They're then able to fix up whatever broken bones or other injuries are present, seal up the person, and hopefully prevent that traumatic wound from turning into a crop infection. Bacteria is everywhere, but localized drug-releasing technologies, such as the one above, are a game-changer in terms of eradicating infection before it turns into an even larger problem. Thank you.
Okay, up next we have Becca Nicholson, who is from Nutrition and Integrative Physiology. And Becca will be talking to us about her talk titled Fat Cystules, Not Foes, Redirecting Lipid Metabolism to Treat Kidney Disease. Have you thought of your kidneys today? It's alright if you haven't, but my goal is to help you appreciate them a little more. And now that they are on your mind, maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, okay, don't my kidneys just passively filter toxins and waste from my blood? But that's not even half the story. I think about kidneys every day and how we can develop new therapies for the 1 in 10 people worldwide who suffer from kidney disease. These are folks whose kidney's function is progressively deteriorating toward kidney failure. And the truth is, we don't currently have a drug or treatment available to cure kidney disease. Another hard truth is that continuing to think of our kidneys as plain old filters isn't going to change that. So I've been looking at them from a different angle. How instead of just serving as filters, our kidneys are also powerful vacuums that suck up uh, valuable elements like water and nutrients from your urine to prevent them from being wasted. And because of this additional role as vacuums, your kidneys are massive consumers of energy, with daily energy costs only running second to your heart. Now, healthy kidneys are self-sufficient and well-suited to burn through fuels like fats to produce enough energy for this vacuuming function. But damaged kidneys are much less capable of burning fats and fuel as fuel. So on the one hand, this means the diseased kidneys produce less energy, but this also creates a scenario where those fats that are typically utilized for energy production are shunted towards other fates. A portion will be safely stored in packaging units called fat droplets, but my research has found that some fats will escape and transform into stress signals that promote cell death and dysfunction. I've identified this conversion of excess fats as stress signals as a culprit of kidney damage across multiple etiologies of the disease. And so to determine if these fat-derived stress signals are a good therapeutic target, my thesis research is to test whether lowering these stress signals in mice improves their kidney disease outcomes. I'm utilizing some genetically modified mice, which lack the cell machinery to make these fat-derived stress signals. And I've also administered some of my animals a new drug to, drop to, to block stress signal synthesis, a drug that could one day be offered to humans. My results show that blocking this conversion of excess fats into stress signals in mice prevents our animals from developing kidney dysfunction. So I'm hoping that somewhere not too far down the line, my work will contribute to translating this new therapeutic strategy to human patients and provide some long-awaited relief to those that suffer from this terrible disease. And for today, I'm hoping that I've given you something exciting to think about, and I wonder if you'll ever be able to think about your kidneys the same way. Thank you. What would you say if I told you that by eating fancy cheese or drinking tequila, you could fight global poverty? It's possible that this is actually true. And my work is aimed at discovering how we can make a difference in the world while eating and drinking well. Poverty remains a major global issue. Rural poverty is some of the worst. 
and it affects us all by forcing the poor to overexploit natural resources to survive. My research contributes to tackling rural poverty by examining the effectiveness of trade systems called geographical indications, or GIs. GIs are intended to improve rural livelihoods and encourage environmental protection. They do this by establishing that people in a specific place have the exclusive right to make a product historically associated with that region. For example, bubbly wine can only be called Champagne if it's from France's Champagne region, and only Italian dairy farmers from Gorgonzola can produce a stinky cheese by that name. Basmati rice, Darjeeling tea, and Blue Mountain coffee are all examples of GI products. Now, GIs should be a win-win. Small farmers retain their way of life while earning a good living. Consumers get high-quality products while feeling good about supporting sustainable development and preserving ecosystems. So what's not to love? Well, as it turns out, some of these systems work better than others. In fact, research indicates that sometimes GIs do the opposite of what they promise. They act as a kind of Trojan horse for multinational corporations to appropriate traditional products, impoverish rural communities, and run roughshod over the environment. My research goal is to determine why some GIs work as designed and others have outcomes that are neutral, negative, or even exploitative. Mexico recently established a new GI for a traditional drink called Ricea, made by farmers in a poor rural region. Now, these farmers are well aware of the mixed track record of GIs, so some are just refusing to participate while others are enthusiastically on board. Last year, I gathered pilot data from both groups that forms the baseline for my dissertation fieldwork. Over the next three years, I'll continue to measure socioeconomic well-being and environmental practices among all producers, comparing results between those who opted into the GI system and those who opted out. With this knowledge, I'll be able to determine whether this particular GI is beneficial and use that knowledge to contribute to a more general understanding of just what makes these systems effective ineffective or harmful. Now, I think I'm just about out of time, but I would like to invite those who partake to sip some cognac and nibbles or let cheese later this evening. But hold off on patting yourself on the back for doing that until my thesis is complete. Thank you. as our enemies? Well, apparently some Utah lawmakers do. In an article that just came out, they actually state that trees suck too much water from the soil and that this is a problem for the drought. So, we should cut them all down. However, nobody touches the green lawns of golf courses. Obviously, science does not agree with this. The fact is that forests act as big lungs for our planet. They actually help clean the air by taking in carbon dioxide and spitting out oxygen. They also help control the temperature. But then why should we care? Well, first of all, we should care because climate change is real. In fact, we know that temperatures are rising and the air gets more and more polluted. And in these forests are our friends. They are actually our climate friends. They keep the atmosphere healthy the same way our lungs keep our body healthy. But then what happens if these forests are damaged? What happens if there is a wildfire that burns down a whole part of the Amazon forest? Or if Mr. John and his rich friends decide that they want to build more cattle ranches? and for that they need to cut trees down. Well, we don't know what happens. 
Actually, we don't know it unless we study how damaged forests look like. And here is where my job comes into play. I actually sit down in front of a computer every day and then think how forests that are damaged can look like. Do they have gaps? How big are these gaps? Which shape do they have? And do all these characteristics have a specific effect on the atmosphere? Well, I actually found that they do. Basically, the size of these gaps and also their distribution have a precise effect on the atmosphere, which is, as if I said, that if we ch take chunks away of our lungs, these will definitely have an effect on our body. So, what's our take-home message for today, then? Well, there are actually three. First of all, trees are our friends. Second, we should definitely mine forest gaps because they do affect our daily life. And third, we need better computer simulations. So, lawmakers cannot go around and state absurdities anymore. Thank you. I are full of trillions of bacteria that outnumber our own human cells. Yet, the truth is, most of us don't stop to think about invisible pathogens until someone we love gets sick. I do research in surgical site infection. More than 40 million people across the U.S. undergo a surgical operation each year. A 3 to 5 percent infection rate is still a major concern. Upwards of 95% of these infections come from bacteria that live in patients' own skin, causing billions of healthcare dollars, compromised health, and lost life. What do surgeons do to prevent this disaster? The answer is skin preparation. Skin prep is the use of chemicals to disinfect the top layer of the skin before a surgeon cuts you open. Skin prep is that chemical stain that you may have seen that's orange on someone after they've had knee surgery. Think of skin prep as the chemical fibers that kill off bacterial infection causing bugs. The FDA regulates how effective these skin prep products are using a scraping technique on the top layer of the skin that quite literally only scratches the surface. Many bacteria live far below this top layer. The chemical fibers applied by surgeons just don't have the time to get that far in. My lab has developed a pig model that is sensitive to the bacteria that live below the surface. I have quantified as many as one billion bacterial bugs in one single centimeter squared of sterile pig skin. We need new skin preparation products to solve this problem. Currently, we are building and testing the next generation of skin prep technology. What will this technology look like? Do we need chemical fibers that act faster? Maybe we need a better delivery system. 
How will this new technology prevent you and your loved ones from getting infected? By answering these questions, I hope to save healthcare dollars. More importantly though, I want to improve patient care. Though I'd never wish a trip to surgery on anyone, I hope that in the future your skin is equipped with the very best infection-fighting technology with carefully tested, safe, and effective skin preparation products that extend beyond the surface. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Lauren Winkler from Medicinal Chemistry, and Lauren's talk is titled, Hey Siri, Help Me Make a New Drug. We've known about contralateral neglect for a long time. 
Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, was intensely interested in stroke and its effects. Arab scholars who carried the Greek medical tradition through the European Dark Ages tried treating it by cauterizing their patients with hot irons. Needless to say, we've come a long time since then. Our understanding advanced by leaps and bounds in the 1800s as the study of neurology came into its own. But it wasn't until very, very recently, with the advent of new tools and techniques, that we were actually able to figure out how the brain does what it does and finally get to the bottom of what's going on in contralateral. My name is Nathan, and in my thesis, I'm trying to do just that. Use new imaging and computational techniques to describe how contralateral neglect affects the brain. But how do I go about doing that? So I work with mice, and what I do is I drop those mice into a fancy, decorated maze with abundant spatial features for them to learn any code. And then watch as they navigate their way to a little piece of chocolate. I must love chocolate. Fun fact. <laughs> and then implant cameras the size of your pinky nail into one of my regions of interest say, the prefrontal cortex, or the hippocampus, which allow me to record videos in real time of neurons firing in the brain as the mouse navigates in place. And then feed these videos into a machine learning algorithm, which watches them, and encodes how those patterns of neural activity represent the space around the mouse, and how those representations change in the device. Now, at this point, it would be perfectly reasonable to wonder how using AI to peer into the brains of mice is going to help stroke survivors. And the honest truth is it probably won't. Not immediately, at least. But the first step to fixing a problem is understanding. And it just so happens that in this case, that understanding can also help inspire algorithms and computations, which can help our cars and our computers navigate through space as safely and reliably as you. All of this is possible because right now, we are in a neuroscience renaissance, where for the first time, we have the ability and the understanding to draw a direct line between brain and behavior, and finally start solving some of these ancient problems. So when you wake up tomorrow, provided something terrible doesn't happen in the middle of the night, you'll see the whole world laid out in front of you, right and left sides. And maybe you'll just wonder why that is. Thank you. This is safer. Okay. <laughs> well, what was I going to say? Oh, so um, in just a moment, we will uh, be taking our 30 minute break. And, uh, but now, please give the judges a moment to be able to step out on their own so they can go deliberate and hopefully get some questions. Uh, and for all the rest of us, this is our time to. Uh, Pull out our ballot uh, by choosing one presenter as your vote for the audience choice. So remember, there's that little piece of paper uh, along with the program. Uh, there are other tables if you don't have one right in front of you. And when you're ready to go out and enjoy the uh, refreshments, please throw out your ballot on the table to the right in the basket. Okay, so enjoy the refreshments. Uh, remember, no food and drinks in this room, please. We're not allowed. And we'll see you at uh, three twenty. About three twenty-two. <laughs> I, I can't read clocks right now. Uh, something terrible happened after this presentation. <laughs> the clock is to my left. <laughs>
All right, everybody, I'm Natalie Gawker, uh, one of your judges. We had a really very difficult uh, conversation back here. You were all so terrific. Congratulations. And you said a very good yeah, very good job. Represented our school so well, and it just was really an honor to learn from you and really to you know, pick up how you rose to the challenge to get up here and use your language so you know, carefully and present in such a strong way and keep the energy high. And I don't know, it was very difficult. You can see all the notes. <laughs> I, we're going to announce the, the audience uh, selection and then the uh, runner-up and then the first prize. I'm going to do the audience uh, selection uh, and her clubs.